There's a new progress report out this week on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 recommendations, and the authors say it'll be their last because they're losing hope they'll ever be met. In the eight years since the calls to action were released, 13 of 94 have been completed, at least according to the Yellowhead Institute. It says this year, zero calls to action were completed. The report estimates that this, at this rate, the 94 calls to action won't be completed until 2081. Joining me now is the co-author of this report and research director for the Yellowhead Institute, Eva Jewell. Eva, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So your report found the federal government didn't complete a single call to action this year. What's, what's standing in the way of progress? Well, we identify five different barriers to uh, the completion of the calls to action. I think one of the one that one of the challenges that um, seems to be an ongoing roadblock is the paternalism from the government. So we see an oftentimes um, overbearing kind of approach to getting any kind of um, movement on the calls to action on the part of the government in, that, in terms of roadblocks. I want to read one line of the report back to you. You write in this study, most of the calls to action remain incomplete as bureaucratic roadblocks, endless debate, and nearly every excuse imaginable delay progress. Those are the words of someone who's clearly frustrated with the state of affairs. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing this for five years. Um, my co-author Ian Mosby has been doing it informally for three years before that. So I would say, you know, frustrated is kind of the... Um, uh, an appropriate way to put it. The polite way, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> uh, you suggest it will take another 58 years to complete the remaining calls to action at the, at the government's current pace. What does that mean for all of the communities, all the activists who are, who are demanding change and reconciliation a lot sooner than that? I mean, I, I think it means ongoing systems of harm that continue to create conditions of inequity for Indigenous peoples. Um, and keep in mind, this is the uh, all of the calls to action being completed at a rate of 1.625 a year. Um, the most progress we saw was in one year, and that was in 2021 following the Kamloops uh, Indian Residential Schools graves, um, the revelations of those graves outside of the schools. And at that point, uh, Canada completed three calls to action in three weeks alone. Um, and even at a pace of three calls to action per year, we're still looking at three decades of calls to action completed. So, you know, do with those numbers what you will, but we need to see a lot quicker action and more substantial action on the part of the federal government if we want to relieve the conditions of inequity that Indigenous peoples continue to face. Yeah, and it seems like the things they've moved on so far have been largely symbolic. I don't want to take away their importance. Certainly there there is something to be said for having a statutory holiday to mark truth and reconciliation, but a lot of them maybe not the meat and potato issues that a lot of communities are really concerned about. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so the first 42 calls to action are those that um, are in the legacy calls to action, and they are uh, on the part of they're meant to redress the systems of harm that continue to exist um, in Indigenous people's experience, and that's in child welfare, in education, in health, culture and language, and justice. And so those um, structures are ongoing, they're contributing to ongoing harm that Indigenous peoples are experiencing, particularly children, as we see in the first five calls to action deal with child welfare, and we haven't seen much movement. Um, and the movement we have seen has been because Canada has been forced um, by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal and ordered to actually move on those calls to action. So we're, we might see some action on those in the coming years, particularly because there's a $20 billion settlement, um, uh, sorry, $20 billion of the $40 billion settlement that was recently settled is going to system reform of child welfare systems. So we're cautiously hopeful, but we have a lot of reason to be skeptical of the federal government's inaction. The government did come close to finishing at least one call to action this year, and that's the creation of a national council, a body designed to track Canada's progress on reconciliation. But I understand you have some concerns about how the council will be structured. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, we're worried that there might not be enough um, investigative powers uh, provided to the council to summon the data that is needed to um, give us a better idea of what inequities Indigenous peoples are facing. I mean, we can tell you as Indigenous peoples, uh, First Nations specifically, can tell you um, the funding inequities are rampant and racism within the healthcare, uh, within all the systems of healthcare, justice and education are, are rampant. 
But until we have a clear picture of exactly how wide those gaps are on an annual basis, we're not really going to be sure how to address or, or exactly what the best measure is um, to address those concerns. And so the council might not have those investigative powers. We're also concerned about the funding of the council. Um, one of the senators had said that they're um, concerned about the council only having a shoestring budget. And another reason we're concerned is that Canada has an outsized role, we call it, um, in that they select more members of the National Council than any of the Indigenous groups. And so um, there's just those are some kind of outstanding concerns. The National Council is also tasked with uh, following up on the calls to action every year, kind of like doing the job that we've been doing over the past five years. And we're concerned that they might not be properly resourced to actually um, produce, you know, an in-depth analysis to give us a, a, an update about how the calls to action are going. Yeah, the government set aside $126 million for the council, but it was just like a one-time uh, pile of cash. I mean, it's not a consistent funding arrangement, and I know that's been an issue. Do you think the Prime Minister gave Indigenous peoples a false sense of hope when he promised to implement all the calls to action without really having much of a plan to do it? I think so. I think there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of hope, and a lot of people really believed him when he said, um, you know, tearfully that he was going to promise to implement all of the calls to action. And in fact, you know, his track record showed that he actually slowed the calls to action with the several lawsuits and the um, the obstruction to justice for First Nations children, specifically in the child welfare case. Um, you know, it is it is very disappointing because I think a lot of Indigenous people had hope uh, for a change in this country's um, leadership, and it's just disappointing to say the least. Okay, let's leave it there. Thank you. Eva Jewell, Director of the Yellowhead Institute, appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. For the federal government's response to this report, we turn now to the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, Gary Anand Sangari. Minister, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, JP. So the Yellowhead Institute found the government hasn't completed a single call to action this year. They claim the machinery of government just doesn't really care about getting this work done. What's your response to them? Um, I, I can assure you that since 2015, since the TRC calls to action uh, were released, uh, our government's been working on implementing uh, the issues that are of, uh, of strictly federal purview or that are, are shared responsibly with the federal government. Uh, and and um, every day we're working towards advancing uh, many of the calls to action. But oftentimes some of these calls to action can um, last years. So for example, uh, in 2021, we passed the United Nations Declaration um, on Indigenous Peoples Act. Uh, this year, we released the action plan to implement the act, which involves a whole government approach. Now, this re requires a review of laws, um, and, and it will take time to implement just this one uh, call to action, which is number 43. And we have many examples where it, it will take longer. Um, it is not just an exercise in, in ticking a box, it's about making sure we have substantive changes um, in government, in the way we operate, in the way we engage. Uh, we brought forward legislation, Bill C-61, which is the first co-developed uh, piece of legislation that we've uh, we've brought forward since UNDRIP. Uh, and it's a critical um, sign that, that we are moving in the right direction. Um, I too am sometimes uh, frustrated at the pace uh, of progress, but but I believe we're in the right direction. We're working uh, diligently to ensure that all the calls to action are uh, implemented, and we work uh, with the First Nations in UN and Métis uh, to that effect. I know it's not just about ticking a box, but sometimes just getting a few of the simpler ones done might signal to people that you care about this issue. I mean, not some of them are complex, as you say, but some of them are really not. I mean, I'm looking at number five, develop culturally appropriate parenting programs for Aboriginal families. Number, uh, number six, repeal the spanking law, section 43 of the criminal code. I mean, some of these things could be done relatively easily. They wouldn't need years of uh, consultation with Indigenous folks. You can just have some goodwill that you are actually acting on some of the things that might not take as long. Why haven't you taken that approach? Well, JP, like, for example, the spanking law is now coming through the Senate, as, as you may know already. So it is something that, that is in the process of, of, of being implemented. Uh, we have many other 
piece of legislation that that are a lot more complicated. So you know, C ninety two, for example, um, is it's a child welfare legislation. Again, it it we brought into force. Uh, we are we are funding it now. We're in the process of. Uh, of developing uh, partnerships um, and, and ensuring and enabling uh, uh, nations to to take on that jurisdiction uh, if and when when they want to and when they're ready, uh, but all of that takes time. And and I think you know I get your point that some of them are much easier than others, but there are many more that are multi jurisdictional that requires a, a lot more um, uh, development and 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 consultation and and actual partnership with indigenous people. And that's something that we simply cannot rush. Uh, and, and I believe that on, on virtually every single call to action, we are on the right track, uh, and we are committed to to, uh, to to bringing this forward. Um, while this year, um, you know, we have seen so many different things that have been brought forward um, by government. So C29, for example, is, is a piece of legislation that covers four calls to action. Uh, that's the National Council on Reconciliation. Um, you know, we have, it, this is now passed the House, passed the Senate, the Senate has come back with amendments, and we look forward to its passage early in the new year. Um, and, and, and that is just one example of, of the work that we have done this year. Just because we may not have completed it does not mean that we haven't worked on it. We have um, spent a great deal of time and, and, and uh, a great deal of, uh, of effort with um, Indigenous partners to get to this point. Uh, and, and, and like this, there are many other um, uh, calls to action that we're working towards implementing. And forward to implementing them as soon as possible. Like you say, there has been some progress on the calls to action. We have the statutory holiday now to mark truth and reconciliation. We've changed the citizenship oath, or at least the government has. You've given money to some archivists, for example. These are the things that the Yellowhead Institute concedes you've done. But a lot of these are not issues that will affect people's lives directly. Do you understand why there is this frustration out there amongst Indigenous communities and advocates that, you know, you've done things that are reasonably easy to do, but you might not have done the hard work to actually initiate some systemic change? Um, and, and, and look, I, I share in the frustration and, and I share that, that you know, we should uh, really aim to do things faster. But let's look at, for, for example, the, the work around C92. This is the critical child welfare legislation that has for many years uh, disenfranchised many uh, Indigenous children from their communities. Now, this is a piece of legislation that came into force several years ago. We are um, in the process of implementing it, which requires us to enter into agreements with different communities who are ready to draw down this jurisdiction. Um, it requires us to build uh, systems within these communities, which requires training, which requires um, support from a, for like a fiscal management uh, perspective. And we, while we have the funding for it, we also need to get into, you know, to, to ensure that the community is able to, uh, to discharge that duty. Um, and then it's, it's about in every step of the way, co-developing these processes with Indigenous people. So this is a substantive issue that we're working on, and it's not a, a single year um, uh, uh, completion uh, point. It is one that's going to take multiple years. But at the end of it, we're, we have made systemic change. This is the type of substantive change that I think uh, the TRC calls on, and, and we are absolutely working towards that end. And yes, of course, we want to do it faster, but in some cases, um, it may not be possible, and, and we're not going to take shortcuts on something that's so critical uh, and that's been um, you know, identified as one of the most important things that uh, Indigenous people are looking for, which is self-determination uh, over their children, um, and we look right. forward to implementing uh, those things. I don't have much time left, but I want to squeeze this in. I know you say it, it takes more than a single year. I think everyone concedes that point, but the Yellowhead Institute projects it will take another 58 years to actually implement all the calls to action. That takes us to 2081. Is that the government's timeline? Absolutely not. Uh, our timeline is uh, is immediate, um, and we will continue to work in a sustained manner, in you know, a whole of government approach to ensure that we address uh, these critical needs. This is not uh, reconciliation. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, that's one thing that I'm I'm uh, mindful of. But it doesn't mean that we need to wait 50 years. It means that we need to do everything we we can, uh, and that's what I'm doing each and every day, as well as my department, as well as uh, our government, to ensure 
that we are on this path towards reconciliation. Um, and, and we look forward to ensuring not just the calls to action, 92, 94 calls to action, but also uh, ensuring that we have self-governing agreements, we have um, government recognition, we have modern treaties uh, that are established um, while we uh, are, are implementing these 94 calls to action. Okay, let's leave it there. Thank you to the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, Gary Anand Sangari. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, JP, and happy holidays.